Hi, everyone, and welcome to Choral Arts. I'm April Angeletta, Associate Director of Communications for the Choral Arts Society of Washington, and I'm here with our Artistic Director, Scott Tucker, and Carol Barnett, one of the composers who had some pieces featured on our concert, Music by Women on a Mission. And as everyone probably knows by now, uh, that, that concert wasn't able to happen because of the, the current health situation. But we wanted to make sure we featured the music of women composers in some way so that it could be out there and be heard. So we're here with Carol today to talk about her music. And Scott, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thanks a lot. April. Well, hello, Carol. How are you doing? Doing fine, Scott. You're looking great. <laughs> You're looking great yourself. Um, we were just, before we just started rolling, we were just discussing that we haven't seen each other for uh, several years, although it seems like yesterday. Um, we worked together in 2006, and um, that is a very fast 14 years ago. Yes. <laughs> Really fast. I, it seems like about five. Yeah, I know it. I, for to me too. So, in t in in just kind of uh, exploring with you today, I would just wanted to ask you a couple of background questions, answers of which I think I already know. But um, you started as an instrumentalist, didn't you? Yes. A, a flute, a flutist. Is that right? Or well, uh, actually. It my dad was a piano teacher, so piano was my first ah, instrument. I see. And then we had instruments lying around the house from when he was a music ed person. And ah. so I started on Uncle Alfred's cornet and graduated to what I really wanted to play, which was flute. Uh -huh. And I discovered that lots of flute players were around, so I thought, well, okay, I'll play piccolo. But not everybody likes to play <laughs> piccolo. Aha. So was... uh -huh. So growing up in a music ed household, is that uh, that gave you a sort of a general uh, kind of uh, background to lots of different instruments? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, um, we had a trombone, we had a cornet, we had a violin. Both my sisters, you know, both I and my sister played violin. And what, at one point we actually had four pianos in the house but we were storing a few of them <laughs> for other people. Um, but, you know, duets and, and uh, uh, lots of recordings, classical recordings mostly. Um, it was, and my dad taught at, how, at, at home. He had his own studio. Oh, so it was, it was a great education. And we all sang in church choir and, and school choirs, all that sort of thing. Right. Well, that maybe uh, leads me to my next question. I, you know, I was wondering, with all that instrumental background a lot of your music is vocal um not all of it of course i know you've written a lot of instrumental pieces as well but maybe a majority has been written for voices is that is that accurate um as i suppose as far as title count goes mm -hmm, uh, uh, half i don't know i'm about <laughs> half and half i'm guessing yeah. here uh -huh. But, you know, uh, the reason for that is because is Dale Worland. You know, I, I uh, got to be composer in residence for him in 1991. Uh, he had commissioned a couple of arrangements before that. And suddenly my life turned 90 degrees into choral. And uh, uh, he, he, it was wonderful. It was like going back to graduate school because he would hand me a whole big pile of, of uh, CDs and say, find the good stuff. Um, <laughs> and uh, I knew what he wanted to hear. So uh, it was, you know, it was listening, listening, listening. And it was, it was great. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about that. So you were about 10 years with him. Is that right? Yeah. Eight his, season, uh... I think nine, I can't remember. It was, uh -huh. it was nineties basically. Yeah. And actually, that's the first time I, I discovered you was through uh, your work with Dale Worland. Um, so how did that collaboration work? I mean, did it work in different ways? Did, did, did he say, I really want uh, this kind of piece? You know, what, what can you do, Carol? Or, or would you come to him with something that you really wanted to do? Or, or how was the collaboration generally working? It was uh, multifaceted, actually, uh, and it developed as time went on. I'd, he started by asking for maybe uh, two or three arrangements per year, um, and perhaps one big piece uh, or major 
thing for one concert a year. Um, I attended most rehearsals, which was great. I got wow. choral sound into my ear. Um, yeah. And uh, I... I, I felt more uh, comfort, more and more comfortable speaking up during programming. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, aside from finding the good stuff, I would I would get to say why, and I thought that this piece should follow that piece, and you know the huh. the uh, uh, the tonalities meshed better there than they did here, and all that sort of thing. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, so Dale was uh, pretty collaborative that way. Then, I mean, it, yeah. it was pretty pretty open to input from others while he was doing his yeah his, uh, his, uh, his uh, associate assistant uh, conductors and uh, his, uh, Jerry Rubino was another one that that mm -hmm. uh, had a lot of input um, uh, yeah you know if he if he trusted them he uh, he was very open to collaboration yeah did you find that your your choral writing changed during those nine or or so years at all? Uh, did oh, you probably? I, yeah. I I can't put my finger on what, but I'm sure that I was uh, more used to um, thinking about well, the voices sound better here than they do there, and don't paste them up on G's uh, for the whole piece. <laughs> and, you know, right? <laughs> uh, and it's a question also of um, being aware of who's singing what what ensemble is singing so that if i were writing for dale i would i would write to their strengths but then you know if i'm writing for somebody else i try and listen to them to see how how they sound and what what i can write that sounds good for them so yeah yeah so uh well let's let's uh let's zip toward uh 2006 for a minute so um that's the year you wrote a song of perfect propriety for the women of uh, the Cornell University Chorus. Um, one question I had right away was I, I noticed uh, in looking at the publication list that you uh, we did that the same year that you um, published or maybe wrote um, your bluegrass mask for which you're you're very well known. Were you write, were you, were you writing those at the same time? I know the perfect propriety is much smaller, but um, <laughs> were you were you writing those concurrently? No, no. I think I think song of perfect propriety was before, slightly before, because okay. uh, if it was in two thousand six, I'm looking at my notes here. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, um, bluegrass mass was actually premiered, I think, in the January of two thousand seven. If I'm if I'm right. Um, and, uh, I probably just hopped right off of, of, uh, Song of oh, Perfect Propriety and got on with the, one with into the, the other. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, uh, listening to an interview you did, uh, in Vancouver, uh, when you were out with Electra ah. and you mentioned Song of Perfect Propriety, um, as well as Remember the Ladies in your list of your favorite, uh, treble pieces, which was great. Um. So, and I had forgotten, uh, you mentioned in that interview that uh, the text suggestion actually came from, from one of my students at Cornell. Yes, it did. It did. Oh. And in fact, uh, the, the whole process of Song of Perfect Propriety was, you know, moved my mind a little bit forward uh, yeah. as far as, as that kind of collaboration and uh, your theme, which was no whining, no flowers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I thought, oh, great. Uh, and ever since, I've, I've sort of thought, no whining, no flowers. It's a, it's a good thing to have when you're looking for texts. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah, and the the women really took to it. In fact, that pro, that uh, that project uh, is still going uh, uh, at Cornell. There's they've been doing it now for I can't remember. You weren't the first, but you might have been the second or third um, uh, composer that I asked to do that. And then we did several until I left in 2012, and then. Uh, Robert Isaacs has kept that going. He's, he's had a number of things since then. So it's really taken off, which I'm really so excited about. Um, so yes, just so briefly for people who don't know it, the project was to say, uh, to commission women composers to set texts by women, uh, which were not about, oh, woe is me, my man has left me, or uh, oh, look at the pretty flowers. So no whining, no flowers. 
And the, the text uh, that you set is just so fantastic. In fact, of all the things that we did in that project, it's, it's my favorite, honestly. And I've done it now a couple times since in different contexts. Well, and you know, uh, the the women who came forward, forward with all those texts, I still have some that I'm waiting to set because oh, there were great. a lot of good ones. Yeah. Uh, it's a remarkable group of women over there. And, and uh, um, that was such such a nice part of the project to make it collaborative that way. Yeah. So um, it's very piratey uh, and uh, it's, it's a pretty... It's a pretty uh, pretty tough piano part, actually. Um, not not impossible, but uh, it's certainly uh, it's not your average umpa uh, piano part. I know, but but uh, <laughs> piano parts need to be more than umpa. You know? <laughs> I'm, I'm a militant about that. Yeah, I I like um, you know in a lot of your music, uh, you know, you do you're so sensitive to text, especially textual rhythm. And so uh, a lot of things that get set, it seems, by you are, are um, you know, they have some mixed meter, they have some odd meter in them, right? This, there's always that slight off kilter uh, moment in, especially in prose, but in poetry too, where you'll, you'll, you'll just go with that rhythm. And it's, um, it's really so delightful. I mean, are you... Um, do you have any influences uh, based on that sort of setting of of text? Does anybody uh, in your past or you know composers that you are particularly interested in? One of my teachers, Dominic Argento, always said that you know, he didn't. Uh, it seemed to me that he didn't hesitate to give the text to syllables the room they needed. Um, yeah, and I thought, you know, there there was one moment, in fact. Uh, when I was talking with Philip Brunel about uh, uh, the Bluegrass Mass, and he pointed out a, a, a section that said, fur and feathers, and he said, nobody will ever get that. I thought, oh, yes, they will. <laughs> I'm going to press crop, so they do. <laughs> you can make sure they hear that. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's great. I, and and in, in uh, the other piece we were going to do is uh, Remember the Ladies. And, um, uh, you know, that's, uh, you mentioned in your interview that your sister uh, recommended maybe you look at the letters of Abigail Adams. Yes, well, uh, she lives in near Boston on Cape Ann, and uh, right. she loves reading about uh, John Adams and, of course, Abigail as well, especially Abigail. So um, that was natural, uh -huh. and, and uh -huh. it, it fits so well you know, because the, uh, the the women were of uh, all state choir in in Minnesota were looking for something like that and. Oh, perfect. Again, just a perfect text. And and um, I'm wondering for you, is there any difference? in Because that text was prose. I mean, it comes from a letter. Um, basically, Abigail is saying, you know, to John, when you're writing your constitution, remember the ladies, you know, don't, don't put all the power into men because what does she say? All men will be tyrants if they could, right? <laughs> But it's uh, so it's a great it's a great text. But I'm wondering about the difference between setting poetry and and prose like that. If there are any special challenges for you? Not really. Uh, Dominic always used to say he preferred prose because he he wasn't then uh, interfered with by the the rhythm of the uh, poetic text. Um, yeah. It is what it is. You know, sometimes you can, you, you stretch out the poetic text and it becomes prose if, if that's what it means. <laughs> be, so. Yeah. I, yeah, I see. Um, uh, I think April, uh, was there not a question or two from a chorus member about the, um, these two pieces? Um, I do have a couple of questions for, from the chorus about your two pieces. And if you don't mind me indulging, my, my husband is a banjo player and he actually has a question about <laughs> the bluegrass mass. <laughs> um, so I'll, if that's okay, I'll ask that one as well. Um, but Linda, who is a member of our chorus, asked, how did you choose this particular letter to set to music? And have you considered letters of other wives or women who may or may not have influenced their husband's political decisions? 
What did you want to emphasize most in how you put this text to music? <sighs> Hi, question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This is um, how question one it? from Linda, <laughs> which is five parts. <laughs> no, I, I chose it I, because my sister recommended it, and I thought, well, this is great. So, and it cut down on the time that I would have to spend going through all the letters. Oh. She, she especially liked that one. So, that was a good thing. Um, I have considered other texts. Um, haven't used any of them yet, but I certainly am open to it. Um, what's the third one? Um, last, last. Part. And what did you want to emphasize most in how you put this text to music? The individuality uh, and the emphasis on yes, we are women, and and this is how what you know from where we come. Uh, our view of the world and and uh, all men would be tyrants and we know that and uh, we are prepared so there <laughs> also um, it was interesting that you uh set it musically uh in a kind of a uh early sort of a i guess a kind of an early classical style uh actually music, what so. i was trying to do was to set it sort of in the, in the style of music as it would have been heard at the time of the writing of the letter. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, you need to emphasize um, the tyrant thing. And uh, right. <laughs> um, so there are <clears throat> a few uh, more modern things that come in. <laughs> yeah, the tyrants, the tyrants, if he could, it, it certainly sticks out in your, in your head when you hear them. Yeah. Um, was there another question as well, April? Yes. Uh, we also have a question. Uh, have you considered putting other Dorothy Parker verses to music? I can imagine Dorothy Parker damning her perceived position as a little lady, ready to show the males that she can do as much or more than they, just as she did through words at the Algonquian. Have you considered other 20th century female poets? Oh, yes. Um, and my mind goes blank as to names, but... Um, <laughs> I, this particular Dorothy Parker was, uh, it, it sort of, it started out working against no whining, no flowers, because she was sitting there at her desk writing little verse. Um, right. But, you know, there's always, there's Dorothy Parker underneath that, and we know that she was not just sitting at her desk writing little verse. Um, I find a lot of Dorothy Parker uh, a little surfacey. Um, to be uh, written to be funny, you know, um, and uh, I think I would have to again dig underneath the surface to find uh, what Dorothy Parker is really talking about, which is probably again, here I am, I am a woman, but I'm sitting at this Algonquin table and I'm not going to give an inch. So, yeah, yeah, it, it was great the way you you know set that uh, with the dichotomy between those two thoughts, you know how she'd love to be a pirate, all that incredibly graphic uh, description of what it would be like to be a pirate. And then always ending with that, but I am uh, writing little verse as little ladies do. And, uh, you know, musically, you, you know, you just pointed out there's so much liveliness to the pirate uh, music and so much verve and, you know, blood and guts. And then you have this uh, Victorian sounding, you know, parlor music, you know, for the little ladies. It's, it's just so wonderful. So it really points out um, uh, that it's, there's, there's, uh, a, you know, there's the sarcasm in, in, in that final line each time. Sure. And then, you know, the second, second part of it is the siren who's the, um, what, ripping men's hearts in two. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and at the end, yeah. she's writing little verse, but underneath there's yes. that current of uh, yeah. syncopation and uh, uh, nasty noises from the choir. <laughs> right, right. It was terrifying to conduct as a male, I'll tell you, because you know, <laughs> there they all are, digging into this verse about ripping our hearts in half. And uh, yeah. Um, April, why don't you go ahead with uh, Chuck's question about uh, the bluegrass mass? Yeah, so he, uh, Chuck, my husband, he's a composer and a banjo player. And uh, he asked, was the bluegrass mass written for a particular bluegrass band? And have there been 
issues with subsequent performances because most bluegrass musicians don't yeah, read yeah. music notation. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, would, I yes, was wondering yes, the yes, same. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, early on, we decided that uh, a, an established band would be a good thing to work with because at least you know they're they know about working with each other and uh, having to cross the divide between bluegrass and uh, classical choir music is hard anyway. Um, and so, <laughs> so we found a wonderful band here, uh, and uh, the the fiddle player and lead singer was classically trained, so no problem. Uh, her husband, the bass player, uh, read. Uh, the mandolin player could read, but he hadn't for twenty years. Um, the guitar player didn't read at all, and uh, the banjo player. <laughs> the original banjo player, uh, I, I sent them the first movement, which was, I think, the most gnarly one. Um, it just did not sound at all like bluegrass. And <laughs> the banjo player packed up and left in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> without telling anybody. But, <laughs> but then they got their original banjo player back, who is a polymath. And you know, he, he had the whole thing memorized by the time the first performance was and, and he you know he could do anything so um and i i actually sat and worked with the band for uh several sessions before they even got together with them. and i <laughs> i sang with them uh and played parts on the piano and things and choir parts and it, it's it was a, you know trying to squash things together um but yeah it, uh there have been lots of issues uh, since and and uh, it's it depends on whether the players have played together before. And sometimes I go uh, to a performance and or dress rehearsal and performance and uh, their pickup group and you know three or four of them will be excellent and then one of them is just sort of it's the first time ever of having to watch a conductor. Yeah, which is a really oh yeah um <laughs> it's a challenge it's very experience. different so uh it, it it's it's always different and it's always interesting um yes i i was wondering that too because when i've looked at i've looked at that score and i thought oh wow i have to get a couple of players who really can read and yes and then then that issue of um trying to do it with a pickup group Mm -hmm. Yeah, then you lose that uh, cohesiveness of a of a band. Yeah, but not not impossible. So just shifting gears a bit, I I I know in your artistic statement you say this. You know, I believe that music is a language based on nostalgia. Could you just build on that a little bit for me and, and let me know what you what you mean by that? Well, um, as a composer, when I'm thinking about what to express, um, whatever sounds uh, we hear bring back other memories of when we heard those sounds before. So for instance, if I'm, well, for instance, if I want to express something that sounds like uh, Abigail Adams' time, I'm going to go looking for uh, something that will help the mind go back to that time. So um, I'm searching for words here. I'm thinking of the, the music that was at that point. But um, if if I want to express happiness, for instance, as a general thing, um, I'm definitely not going to be in a minor key. I'm going to be in a major key, probably, or a, a, you know, a, 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 a happier mode, uh, and I'm probably going to write something that sounds like something I heard when I was happy. Um, I might, in fact, try and imitate composers that I heard when I was happy. For instance, um, there's one spot in. Um, uh, the Bluegrass Mass, uh, and it's not the, well, now I'm really missing the words, but it uh, it sounds like a, a sort of a, a protest song from uh, people who are not in power. And I thought, ha, 
this is going to sound like the 60s. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's not the da 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 And I'm, you know, and I always sing along in that part because that it brings me back to when I was in college and and uh, I I heard that kind of music. And I right. it's it's that's my nostalgic take on it. When I was um in about 19 in the mid, mid 80s sometime when I was working at, at Harvard, um, uh, Dominic Argento came to Harvard uh, because uh, they were doing one of his pieces. And I asked him a lot of, you know, questions, many of which were probably very naive. But I, I do remember one thing he said to me, which struck me at the time, because in the mid 80s, he would have been what, in his 70s, maybe. Um, he was born in 1927. Uh, so, okay. So he was in his sixties, but he said, um, uh, I said, what, what would you say to young composers now? He said, uh, I'd say to young composers, write as much as you can now, uh, write everything you can, uh, when you're young. Um, and I read into that a, a little tinge of, you know, uh, it was harder now, uh, for him in, in his sixties, uh, or late sixties, whatever he was at. Um, and I, and you're such an active composer, and I'm not going to ask you your age, but I know that you're 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 not in your twenties. Um, so so yes. <laughs> how is the problem? I mean, what do you think about that statement that he made? I mean, how do you relate to that, or do you feel like um, that's not that's not you? <laughs> As somebody who used to march into Dominic's office, not really march, creep into Dominic's office <laughs> <laughs> every uh, week for a lesson, you know, with my 12 measures, because I hadn't been writing that much. Um, uh, I think it's great advice. Uh, I always tell composers, listen, 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 read, 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 uh, you know, and, and just experience the world around you. <laughs> but I think Dominic has a good point. Don't forget to write it down. Um, uh, you know, I mean, there are composers who wait to write until the moment is right, and it's that that's not a good idea. Um, you need to practice your craft. That's the only way it's going to develop. Um, and I, I think Dominic, uh, I love best of Dominic's music some of his earlier things. Um, I think maybe, well, I don't know. Um, it doesn't get harder. And, uh, you know, it, if it gets harder, maybe it needs to get different. I get bored writing the same thing. I, I have, I've noticed about, about your music. I mean, it's so varied and eclectic. You have such a, a variety of styles. Um, and uh, it's, it's fun to go underneath into the next levels down uh, on a on a project, so that you know you uh, you get assigned something, and you think, okay, I'm going to use this text, and it's sort of like the texts that I've been used before, but it's by a different writer, and they're from a different part of the world, and yeah, you know, what, what can we do that's different about that? Yeah. I, I, and you, you do, I mean, you're, you're very facile at, at, uh, right. I mean, you know, your, your piece that was inspired by the Syrian, um, uprising. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, I've forgotten what it's called, but, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's got that Arabic flavor to it, uh, but it's not, you know, I, I think a lot of, uh, composers would fall into, uh, dilettantish sort of tokenism uh, when trying to take on styles like that. But yours, yours is very, I mean, it, it reaches deeper. It's, it, it expresses the text so perfectly. And it, it, uh, it's, it, I, I don't know how to say it, except that it, it, it just has a genuineness or an authenticity to it. You know, that text I, I found uh, orally, I uh, was listening to a BBC broadcast and, and they read it. And I, I started researching who had written it and what it was for. And it turned out to be uh, uh, Mojak Hoff, who is a comparative literature professor down in the University of Arkansas. And it was taken from a much longer poem. Uh, and I, I read through that poem and I thought, you know, I am not equipped 
um, culturally to take on that whole poem. Mm. But I can get into these this page of, mm. of that. Mm -hmm. that um, it would have taken a lot longer and maybe it would have been impossible for me as, as a non-Middle Eastern Arabic person um, to, uh, to really give that whole poem the, uh, the respect it deserved. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, what you did, I think, is, is really wonderful. And it's another great uh, treble piece, <laughs> really. Yeah, it's beautiful and, and so moving. Thank you. Um, so, you know, as, as we're sort of wrapping up, I wanted to just kind of ask you how you're doing now and how you're doing in this new environment. And, you know, I, I mean, uh, a composer is, um, I mean, it's a collaborative job, of course, but it's also a lot of time writing on your own. Uh, so maybe life hasn't changed a whole lot for you yet. You know, uh, um, I think the the biggest change has been uh, the increase in temptations to not uh, be at home working, uh, which of course we always are. But but uh, now there are all these streamings. I mean, the Metropolitan Opera is streaming different <laughs> operas every night. You know, like, right. and uh, you could spend your whole day being culturally enriched. <laughs> 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 but no, you, you know. Uh, Philip Brunel sent out a really fun uh, JPEG the other day, which uh, the first picture was composer um, and, you know, sitting at the keyboard with the monitor and speakers uh, and an empty room. Uh, and the second page picture was composer in isolation. And it was the same picture, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which is true. <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel different. It, um, yeah. It's yeah, uh, you know, it it it's what it is. I mean, the thing I miss most is going is going to the uh, uh, the Y to go swimming. It's mm -hmm. it's shut, <laughs> and yeah. of course the library you know, yeah. to get my audio books. But there are uh, podcasts and things. So yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, my my wife has said uh, it is uh, isolating. But if it weren't for the internet, we'd all be a goner. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? This has been really wonderful to talk with you about your music and uh, how you're doing with everything that's happening. I know it's it's a crazy time for everyone, um, but we're just really glad we got to spend some time with you today. Yeah, this has been fun. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Carol. Really, really appreciate yeah, it. And what a joy you. to hear you again. And um, yeah, uh, do, uh, b before we end, sorry, uh, do you have any uh, projects you're working on right now? Yes, uh, <laughs> the project I've wanted to do for years, uh, and uh, it's a, a setting of five soliloquies uh, of Shakespeare women. So, uh, and I finally found uh, a mezzo that I really love, and uh, she sings with occasionally with a, uh, a local orchestra, a community orchestra, mm -hmm. that my late husband uh, used to have all his pieces done by because the, uh, the conductor of the orchestra was in the uh, Minnesota orchestra along with my husband. So uh -huh. I thought, well, now that John is gone, maybe I can inherit this lab band. And so um, <laughs> it's, it's happening, um, the uh, soliloquies, it was supposed to happen in fact in May, but alas, now it's happening in November. So. Um, uh, Portia, Juliet, Lady Macbeth, um, Ophelia, and Cleopatra. Wow, <laughs> Girl, that's a, what a great project! That's oh, a great, it's wonderful. Great idea. It's, been, it's been fun to finally, finally put it down on paper and to learn piles of new information because I've been doing all the engraving myself. <laughs> and ah, <laughs> yes, of course, right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that, um, that that is the project that I'm trying to wrap up, and it will not wrap up, but it will, okay, you know, eventually. And, and yeah, and then there's uh, and what's really interesting, aside from new projects, uh, new com composing projects, is that when you get to be <clears throat> a certain age, uh, all your pieces are um, stored in. Um, uh, media that is going out of uh, out of style and so all my pieces up to a certain point had been hand engraved 
by me um, because I used to do that for a living. And now uh, the big thing is changing them all over to, uh, you know, computer engraved, all that sort of thing, which right. um, unless you have a big trunk full of uh, loot from being a pirate, uh, did <laughs> 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 you sort of do it yourself and at yeah. time. So, you know, I'm it, in the morning, I compose in the afternoon, I'm an administrator and at night I'm an engraver and it's, uh, um, <laughs> you know, that's, it, it's all working from home and it's, uh, yeah. it works really well. <laughs> well, again, a pleasure, pleasure to talk to you, Carol. And my pleasure. Please take good care. Stay safe. Okay. You too. All right. All right. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.